coming up next on the Wet Fly Swing podcast. I saw a black bass jump out of the water and grab a red wing blackbird. And I says, oh, man, you know, you don't get to see that stuff. Well, I tied on a long streamer hook. I tied the body and the tail, and I had two small eyes sticking out of the sides of the body. That was Steve Potter on how he matches the hatch with the red wing blackbird. Great hooks for soft tackles, salt water, the cicada, and the cigar fly today on The Swing. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. Hey, how you doing today? Thanks for stopping by the show. Quick shout out to the schooloffishing.co. Schooloffishing.co is the place you can check out our next trip, our next giveaway, everything we have going. We're sending everything out that way, and you can check it out. You can find out where we are heading on the river and where we can connect with you next. Before we get started, let's hear from our sponsor. Waters West Fly Fishing Outfitters is your go-to resource for swung fly techniques, two-handed casting, and anadromous fish. Find out why Waters West has built a cult-like following around their fly tying materials and shop and why they are the go-to resource for OP and beyond. Please head over to wetflyswing.com slash waterswest right now and check in with Ed and Kyle and get geared up for your next trip on the water. Steve Potter is on the show today to dig into deer hair poppers, and he walks us through the steps to choosing the right hook for the next fly you're going to be tying. We get some bass bug tips, find out who are some of the best tires and resources that he knows about there and where to buy great deer hair. We're going to dig into it, Steve's favorite flies and the hooks you need to tie them. So here we go. Without further ado, Steve Potter. How you doing, Steve? Oh, I'm doing great. Uh, it's a little windy outside. I can't go fishing, so I'm here. <laughs> yeah, how, how's the transition? You've made a transition, it sounds like, across the country from the West Coast to the East Coast. What's that been like? Oh, it's um, it's been fabulous as far as a retired guy. Oh, been... right. You reti- That's it. So you retired and headed to the to – the, where, where were you before Florida? Uh, I was in the Bay Area, in, in uh, San Francisco Bay Area. A little bit in um, Tracy, California, uh, Santa Clara, California, and uh, that area probably for 25 years. Oh, wow. What's the uh, Bay Area for somebody who hasn't lived there or been there? What, what is, you hear a lot about it, but what, what's it like? What's it about? Well, it's the area in San Francisco area surrounded by the San Francisco Bay and the, and the Delta tributaries and it's uh it's a really neat fishing resource but it's beautiful too and it's um they they have uh bases navy bases and they have uh, air force bases and stuff around the area and it's um that's where my dad that he was retired navy and i finished up my career at the the um uh, treasure island naval station there it was a training station oh gotcha yeah and you retired in 85 1985 21 years yeah this is great we i actually have a little connection I have, i've never been in the navy but i had like a great uncle who was in the navy and he was actually i think let's see he was obviously he was a little before your time but um but yeah he was he was into it i think he was at the you know at some higher levels and he was part of the um part of the everything that was going on during you know world war ii right uh-huh. when you had kind of japan and we were trying to fortify that area up north up in alaska he was a big player up there and um and so i heard a lot of stories that they actually his son wrote a book about him wow. and it, it got me really interested in you know what i mean more into the navy and just everything because it's like wow you must have had some pretty amazing stories over the years doing that oh it was it was a lot of fun i i uh, made warrant officer uh, on our aircraft carrier. And, uh, I, I got to see a lot of stuff. I worked in a shipyard repairing st- stuff and I just, I, I was pretty well versed. I, when I first joined the Navy, I would, I was transferred to Vietnam to the Brown water Navy, they called it and spending some time there. 
shuttling the uh, Ninth Division Army people around the area. That was quite exciting. Then um, I got picked. When I got back, I got picked to go to SEER training, which was uh, survival training. And I spent three and a half years there at the survival school, which was kind of neat. And then, you know, I, I finished up on uh, repair ship and uh, firefighting school. And it was well diverse. I got enough knowledge to where I could get on the outside and get a job right away. So. Oh, gotcha. There you go. So you got out and then, so when, when did the fly tying, you know, when did all that come to be in kind of fly fishing? Has that been a lifelong thing or did you get in that after you got out of the, the Navy? It's kind of funny. It was, um, when I was between eight and 12 years old, my dad would take me and my brother to Kennedy Meadows, which is up in the Sierras, not far from the Bay Area where we were at. And we'd fish, and I loved it. But he did the the fly tying part of the fly fishing. And we would use it. And then I got interested in, he liked the dry flies. I liked the wet flies because I was getting more hits on the nymphs up there. But he really enjoyed the blow-ups. Well, I was kind of, I just wanted the tugs. And we got involved with that. And uh, then when I joined the Navy, I kind of quit fishing until I got a couple of ports. I went to New Zealand and I fished there. And I met a really nice family. They took me in overnight. They cooked me dinner and took me fishing. And it was such a neat, neat visit that I had there but I started to want to get back into it uh the tying end of it when I was in New Zealand and so I I got transferred and I kind of went off the end on uh, on the fly tying and I started doing other things until I retired and I started fishing more and I said you know I'm gonna I'm going to join a club and learn a little bit. Well, that was the best thing. Uh, Tracy Fly Fishers just started. And I went in in that and I just took off with it because, I, you know, I wanted to do what my dad did. And he had passed since then. And uh, I wanted to pick up where he was at. Well, he was an extraordinary dry fly tire. Oh, he was. And, oh yeah. He was, he was a cat skill guy. <laughs> oh, he was. Are you, are you at his level on tying dries? No, no, no. What's kept you away from that? Cause I had that same struggle. I, I never became a really great dry fly tire. What, what's <laughs> kept you away from it? Well, I, I think it's, it wasn't the fact that I wanted to do better. It was the fact that I was fishing for striped bass and black bass more than the trout. So I got involved with that type of fishery. And when I started fishing, this guy introduced me to uh, poppers and balsa wood plugs and just all different kinds of stuff. at at our club and I started in that and then I picked up at a at a show this guy uh, Chris Helm was there and he did a a taps bug it's a like a popper bug and I I thought oh this is amazing what he's doing with his deer hair and then I started I studied Billy Munn from uh, Texas I believe but I studied him on the videos and another guy from Texas, uh, Jimmy Nix. And he was a phenomenal also, and he can explain it really good to you on his videos. So I, I kind of picked it up and I kind of improved myself on deer hair. And pretty soon it was just coming good, you know, and, uh, in my club, I started giving a little lessons, and to this day, I get these questions. Uh, 
what's the difference between spinning and stacking? You know, what's the best hook to use, you know, and uh, how how do you get it from, you know, uh, when you're fishing for black bass, how do you keep the fish away from the uh, undergrowth? And, you know, it's just, all these questions were getting fired at me, and I was, I was enjoying it, actually. <laughs> right, right. You were, you were into it. Well, this is good. We we actually had a couple. We've had a couple of episodes um, on tying kind of deer hair with deer hair, and Pat Cohen uh, was on. And, oh, uh, he's fabulous. Yeah, Pat's great, and he's got his own tools, right? The Fugly Packer, and then we got uh, Joe Jackson was also on a really, really cool episode we did um, last year. Um, so we'll touch on that. This is good. I want to, you know, let's just start there with the poppers. You mentioned a couple. What would be if we take people down a road thinking like hooks, flies, some of that stuff, what would be the hook you would be using for, you know, that, um, I'm not sure which poppers you tie. I know you tie some, some of the popular ones. What would be a, a main hook you'd use for tying these poppers? Well, I'm a uh, Daiichi fan, and I love the 2546. And it's, it's basically, it's a specialty hook, but it's a salt water hook. It's stainless steel, and it's a wide range of, of sizes. So I can use a, a 2 aught for black bass and a delta, and I can use a a 5 aught for Dorado out in the – or uh, dolphin fish, you know. And it, it's, it's a good all-around hook. I also use the 2720, which is a stinger hook, and that's a that's a – a wide gap hook and i use that a, a lot for out here in the lakes in florida what would you use the what would a fly that would be tied with the 2720 be that would be like a uh, taps bug or a uh just a, a simple uh, hair bug or you could even put a balsa wood uh, body on it and use it you know gotcha and then the 2546 would be more for tying those really big like uh, doing using the fugly packer and really packing a bunch of deer hair right exactly and then there's also a new specialty hook that uh, daichi just got out it's a 2477 which is a short shank heavy wire hook wide gap and it's it's been my go-to for like uh, game changers and uh, you know and uh, I incorporate my deer hair and my game changers too. And it, it's fabulous, you know, and I got that idea from, uh, uh, one of the guys you mentioned, Pat Cowan among, the fugly packers and, uh, and the threads that I used to get from him. <laughs> yeah. You still use the fugly packer. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And I, I also use, cause I tie a lot of small, like, uh, irresistibles and, um, uh, that type of flies and i used uh chris helm had had a little hair packer that he made it was uh i can't remember the name of it right now but it was uh, a a little spring packer you know and it was just it was uh, a neat little thing to have yeah we'll try to i think chris helms is a guy we'll we'll try to get to on in fact i had a Chris Helms, it's interesting because I have an old friend with, whose name was Chris Helms. I don't think it's the same guy. but um, So you mentioned the irresistible. What, what would be the fly uh, or the hook you'd be using for like, a, I'm th- is that like a little kind of a, a, sci- a small dry fly? Well, yes. It's a, uh, it's a dry fly. And I would use, you could use a number of different ones. A standard Daiichi uh, dry fly is 1170. But I like to use the 1190, which is a barbless hook. Oh, barbless. Same same hook, just barbless. Right. And uh, it's way better for releasing, and uh, it's a sweet hook. It's, I've, you know, I've used those for years. Gotcha. This is great. We're already, uh, we're already doing good on our, on our list as far as flies and hooks, because I wanted to go down for, <laughs> you know, somebody who's, you know, a lot of people, you know, there's a lot of people that tie flies for sure out here, but there's still lots of new people coming in. So I was hoping to 
put together, you know, some information here where somebody could be like, okay, here's, here's the hooks, here's the type of hooks. I mean, there's a lot of different types, right? I mean, when you look at your fly tying desk, maybe describe that. What is your, is your desk kind of like consuming an entire room or is it more like you open up a, a case and then you tie your flies? Well, uh, I have, I share a room with my wife. She has an office and I have an office and mine is a little bit bigger than hers <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> and yeah. i have multitudes of thread and hooks and uh you know like i have dry fly hooks uh wet fly hooks streamer hooks salmon hooks you know bass hooks <laughs> i got all that stuff and it, it's just it's amazing and the stuff that i pick up you know, through the shows and traveling around at the different fly shops and stuff, it's uh, it's all pretty amazing. Yeah, it's, it, it's pretty fun. <laughs> That's a great thing about it, right? You can you can probably spend you know however many thousands of dollars on stuff, and you probably would still need to get more stuff, right? Yeah, you know, um, I get that at uh, the shows. People ask me, uh, "How do I get in this? What's the best way to do this?" And I always I say. Get into a local club, or if you have a, a fly shop in your immediate area, go there, and if they're uh, worth their salt, they'll have a um, fly tying group in there, and have them get involved, you know, and uh, fly tying is a neat hobby. It brings out, if you got any artistic ability, it brings it out pretty quick. I tied with a a simple regal for probably 15 years and before that i had a thompson mm -hmm. like the original thompson yeah and you know um and i know a lot of pretty famous tires use thompson vices and they did really good you know i think uh leslie harrop still uses a thompson but you know, it's uh, you don't have to get the the best of all the material or tools, but it helps if you get good materials because you can't make a a good fly with bad materials. But you you know you you can work up to that point, learning the principles of tying, and then building up from that. Yeah, and then you get your your uh, really high quality necks and stuff like that. Where have you, you know, over the years, do you have a place you still, I mean, do you, do you still buy materials? Do you have a place you'd recommend to go or do you pretty much have everything now? You don't need to get anything else. I have a couple of fly shops, White's Tackle in uh, Vero has a, a, a good supply of tackle and, uh, you know, hooks and uh, thread and everything. On my deer hair, if I buy my deer hair from people like uh, Derek Darce, he has a fly shop in, in Idaho. And I used to buy it from uh, Pat Helms, but he, he kind of went from fly uh, supplies to tattooing. Oh, that's right. Yeah. I think he's back. I think he, well, I, last time I talked, I think he was, well, we have to check in with him again. But you're talking about uh, Pat, Pat Cohen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I used to get my deer hair from him and my thread, but Derek, he has a shop in Idaho. He is a phenomenal uh, deer hair tire, and he puts out uh, good deer hair that he picks out. So he sends that to me, and I'm really happy. And who's that again? That's Derek. What's his last name? Dars. D. What is that? D a r s e something like that. We'll find it. We'll track him out. I'll put a link for those people who want to get some good deer hair. We'll see if, uh, I'm not sure if Derek's also doing this for other folks out there, but um, we'll track him down. No, it, it's a, it's a company and I, Oh, okay. Yeah. He's got a, he's got a shop or whatever. Right. It, it's a company. It's a mail order place and um, he's very good at uh, what he does. Perfect. That is good to know. So we'll, we'll put that link in and I, um, 
Good. So, and I was kind of thinking you mentioned, you know, up there at the top, you mentioned wet flies. What would be, you know, you talked about your dad back in the day, how he was doing the dries and you had the wet flies. What would be the, you know, the, the wet fly hook if we're staying on this, this hook and kind of, we're kind of sticking with the Daiichi stuff. Well, again, I go, I go with the 1550, which is just a standard wet hook. And I tie, I tie my, uh, my soft hackles with those and my uh and and the basic nymphs you know your uh the one fly that i tied with my dad and it looked really bad was the the hair's ear you know the basic old hair's ear and i caught my first fish for that and i wish i still had that <laughs> where was that first fish i caught it up in uh up in the mountains in uh california in uh, the Sierras, and it was not far from Kennedy Meadows. And it was, uh, you know, I'll never forget it. Me and my dad and my brother were in a small little drift boat, and he was, okay, you do this, and you do this, and you do this. And I did it, and uh, give it a couple of yanks on it, and uh, fish yanked back at it. <laughs> yeah. I'll see you're like, you're kind of jigging it a little bit. Yeah, that's it. Just all right. Bring it in, you know. That's so interesting because we we just did an episode with like a Euro nymphing. I'm not sure if you get much into the Euro nymphs, but we had a kind of a team or a professional competitive fit, but he was describing the Euro nymphing, right? And how, uh-huh. how he does it. And he was saying, you know, you basically get your nymph down to the bottom as soon as possible and then you just slowly bring it up to the surface like you're imitating an emerging exactly. you know, basically bug, right? Yeah. And, you know, that's what my dad taught me. He says, uh, you can, he, he wasn't an indicator guy and, but he would throw his nymph out and he would lead it sink and then he would bring it back and he would vary his twitch or his pull. And, um, he said, if they don't bite, vary it up some more to the other extent, you know, go fast. You know, and it, it was, it was a, a good learning experience and something that I kept for, you know, hell, 50 years, you know? <laughs> yeah. I'm sure it still works, right? Probably go to the same place and still catch a fish there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. Um, nice. So, okay. So we've, we've dug in here. We've got, I think, um, a few flies. What, what about on streamers? You Maybe you've mentioned a couple of these, but what would be the a good streamer hook uh, to use that you'd be using for? And I'm not sure what streamer, what, what would you be tying? What would be a popular streamer fly you like? Well, besides the woolly bugger, you know. Uh, well, let's just start with the woolly bugger. What, what would be the, the hook you'd use for a woolly bugger? I would use a, um, a 4X long down eye hook. You know, you could use a, a 2220 a Daiichi, any, any of that, that type. A couple of my buddies and I went up to the uh, Missouri River up in Montana, and we were fishing uh, big woolly buggers, and they were rabbit strip woolly buggers. You know, they call, I think they call them the Dalai Lama. <laughs> oh, the Dalai Lama. Yeah, yeah. sure. That's a good that's And a, uh, yeah, they were on uh, on four X long. You know, they're pretty pretty big. Uh, the same hook, the twenty two twenty. Yeah. So the uh, woolly bugger I teach in, in some of my classes, you could tie that like a standard woolly bugger, or you could put some class in it, you know, putting you know, instead of using uh chen- chenille, use uh, ostrich hurl or peacock hurl and put some flash along the body, you know, and then, then put your uh, feather, through there your hackle through it and then make a nice head like a a a soft hackle head you know nice uh, good looking fly and and you know i can't say that they'd catch any more fish but they look so much better when you when you dress them up like that and uh looks are a little bit too you know yeah right 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 (laughs) i'm looking at one here and this is maybe do you do a cicada pattern i do yeah, I, I think I'm seeing, I might be on, I was going to ask you about this, the weekly fly. looks like you've tied some tutorials there, and I'm looking at one now. Um, what would be the 
What would be the cicada? Describe well first. What what is the the cicada? Is that something that's we talk? You hear about that a little bit? Is that something that's popping out in Florida? Well, no, actually, uh, I tied that fly when I was in the Bay Area, but I would go up to uh, Idaho, and they'd have a cicada hatch, and the Green River also has a cicada hatch, and I tied. Uh, a couple of different ones and that cicada is is basically nothing but a goddard caddis with some deer hair work and some rubber legs on it oh that's all it is so it's a goddard caddis right. with, with some rubber <laughs> right. legs i and, see and, you know easy. and i put my name on it you know the cicada and it, you know it took off pretty good um i had uh, a lot of guys wanting you know to use that and i i used it up in the missouri river as the indicator fly and i'd put a, a dropper on it and i'd put a like a zebra midge or a, a, a hairs there on the bottom and if you did get a head on the top it was usually a pretty good sized fish yeah if you hit it right and this is it and would this be like the 1750 daiichi or what would be the hook for this one? Oh, for that one is definitely uh probably the 1720 1720. Okay. You could use like, I wouldn't use a six X long. I use a four X long, either the 20 to 20 or the two X long 1710, uh, nymph hook. Oh, right. Right. Okay. And, and you could, you could vary. It depends on, on, on the size of the cicada too. I see. Right. Size of cicada. Okay. Good. And, uh, and what is the, just so we know the, the weekly fly, do you know much about the background there? Who's running that thing? And if that's still going, well, I'm sure it is. Um, again, I used to go to the snake river cutthroats expo that they had. They just had a big one after the Kovic stuff. I think they had a, a three year holdover and I, that was the first one I missed in a long time. And that was, that's a really good show. And, uh, I use that, you know, it's just a, a great fly for, for that, uh, area right there. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So good. Well, we've got a few, any other, what would be, if you had to say, you know, you've got your list of kind of the top patterns you use and you're, in, you're in Florida now. So I'm guessing that's changed a little bit. What, what's that look like before we get into the patterns, just talk about that change. Are you still, are you just chasing now saltwater species or what's your fishing look like now that you're in Florida? Uh, it's simply amazing. I had, uh, <laughs> I got the, the ocean and, you know, you have uh, sailfish, dolphin fish or mahi mahi. You have uh, cobia. I mean, it's a plethora of fish out there in the ocean. And then in the rivers, you have um, snook, which you have on, on the coast too. But you have snook, redfish, speckled trout, and you have uh, baby tarpon. Sometimes you get some big tarpon, you know, all in the, in the Indian River and the um, Mosquito Lagoon area. And then inland in the lakes, like Okeechobee, Garcia, Stick Marsh, and all the, you know, there's lakes all over the place. And you have uh, phenomenal black bass fishing. So I'm I'm in the middle of the, uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. Have you been tying flies for any of any and all of those species down there? You know, believe it or not, the fly that my go-to fly here is a Clouser minnow. <laughs> oh, yeah. That makes sense. That's and pretty uh, much one of those, yeah. Yeah, it's just that fly and then EPs. EP flies, he's got a lot of, like, the minnows. That's a good all-around saltwater fly. Any kind of small crustacean fly, shrimp fly, uh, crab flies, they work pretty good, you know. If you get a I, – I like them a little smaller than normal, but uh, it's really a, – it's a dynamite fishery, and I think the – Black bass fishery is my favorite, and as far as top water, 
because you get the explosions there and it, it it seems like it's a, a longer top water bite here in florida than there was in california right yeah because you did that you've done the the coastal stuff in california as well right yeah this is awesome well, what would be the clouser if you're if you're tying the clouser what would be the hook you'd be using for that fly that would be the uh, uh 2546 my favorite okay yeah 2546 and then uh, the EP that was Enrico uh, Puglisi, who we had on in episode 210, which was a cool one. Um, what would be his flight if you're tying something smaller? Would you still use a similar hook, or would you have a different same hook? hook? Same hook, but yeah. be smaller though. Or and you could also use that uh, 2477, as I mentioned before. It's a short shank in the smaller sizes, like the twos and fours, and that would be good for the crush station flies. Today's episode is sponsored by Daiichi Fishing Hooks, a leader in the fly fishing industry and still the world's sharpest hook. Daiichi has been producing premier fishing hooks for the past 30 years, a timeless brand with a bright new future. And I have a great connection with Daiichi going back about as long as I can remember. I've tied thousands of flies using those Daiichi hooks. I've tied many dry flies, wet flies, steelhead flies on their vast assortment of hooks. Never once had an issue on strength or quality, so very excited to get the good word out right now. Tempered with carbon-rich steel, Daiichi offers superior penetration without compromising the hook's structural integrity. If you want to support this podcast and a great hook company right now who has been producing high-quality hooks longer than most, check them out right now at wetflyswing.com slash Daiichi. That's D-A-I-I-C-H-I, Daiichi. You support this podcast and local businesses by clicking through that link to Daiichi. Okay, now back to the show. So we've got a little list here going. We've got, uh, we started out with some poppers we talked about. We um, covered, you know, game changers, irresistible. We got a few hooks. What are we missing here? We Are there any flies you tie with different hooks we haven't mentioned um, that we might highlight here? You know, I'm looking at my mouse flies. I use, I use, you know, the stinger hook once in a while, but I still like, I fish golf uh, course ponds along the, the uh, strand, I call it, where the uh, Indian River, it's just uh, brackish water goes through. They have brackish ponds in a golf course and I use, the 2546 because it's stainless steel and it won't rust. But if I go to an all freshwater pond, I'll use the uh, stinger hook because it's got a better bite on it, I think, for uh, black bass. Gotcha. So you'll tie, and is this the stinger like you're actually tying a stinger kind of on the end of the fly, that sort right, of thing? Right, right. Yeah. And then that stinger, and what is that hook you'd be using for the stinger? Oh, no. The, the stinger hook that I'm talking about is a stinger hook. It's a uh, the the twenty seven twenty. Oh, gotcha. Okay, and uh, I usually don't put a a hook unless I'm tying like a a game changer. Then I'll put a stinger on there. I see. Nice. So so we're in. Um, you know, just looking out, it sounds like the the golf pond, or you know, that sounds interesting. What what does that look like getting into that sort of fishing? Is that something where you you hit nine holes and then you stop by and do some fishing or? <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, where where I live, there's a golf course nearby, and uh, I go out there at right before sunset, and I'll I'll go around the pond, and I'll hit it, and it, it's got a couple of species of fish in there, and I've got the black bass, and I've and I've got uh, crappie, but uh, there's a couple of other like a. Uh, alligator gar oh yeah and uh have you caught any of those yet no i haven't <laughs> i'm looking for one though. <laughs> there you go yeah you gotta check out we did an episode on all well this was out of texas but yeah those species that would be a fun one it sounds like that's really a cool experience and yeah there's a few different i'm not sure what species they have there but there's one that gets really big yeah we were out in uh, lake garcia which is a, a freshwater lake it's the the headwaters to the saint john's river so it's it's a pretty good area, and uh, I was fishing for black bass out there, and we saw more alligators than we did uh, uh, black bass. But oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Wow! 
How's that? Have you been around the alligators before you moved there? No. No, it's, uh, you get used to it, you know. It's kind of like bears. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, you need your uh, can of spray if the bears Oh, you have spray for alligators, too. Do you have (laughs) alligator spray? No, no. (laughs) No, nine millimeters better than uh, spray. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Do you do you hear now? How long have you been in Florida? Well, uh, it's a little over three years now. Oh wow! Yeah, that's a good chunk of time. And are you liking the move? Are you feeling like you made the oh, right move? I, you know, uh, I was in the Navy, and my wife was with me in the Philippines, and we spent uh, uh, two and a half years there. Oh wow! And I really enjoyed the climate. You know, and it was a little humid, but it wasn't a dry heat like we had in California, you know, and I could breathe better for me, you know. So when I was in the service, I was in Mayport for a little bit, and I kind of liked it here. So we kind of decided, you know, um, we'd come here and see how we'd like it. Well, we both love it. You both love it. Now tell me this, because we've talked about Florida a little bit. Um, we've had some episodes. Is it cheaper to live in Florida or in uh, the Bay Area? Oh, uh, you know, I don't want to bash uh, California, because I tell you, California is, is a beautiful state. Yeah, it is. It, I mean, it it, is. it's got everything. But the leadership and uh, the way, like, I was retired military, but I was still paying a hell of a lot of taxes. I was paying, uh, you know, the the gas per gallon was over two gallon. It still is over two dollars a gallon more. Uh, my property taxes, you know, all my earnings. It was tough here. It's so much easier to live, and uh, this is a little thing, but I think about it every time I take my boat out. I've been here for three years and I've never had a $25 boat launch fee. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. No fee, no fees for that. That, is, that definitely is a, you know, little stuff like that adds up, right? Oh yeah. And it's just, um, it seems like your tax dollar goes for things that they need, you know, instead of, uh, you know, it's just, it's a little bit better. I can do more things here. Yeah. Gotcha. No, it's good to hear. So it sounds like it is probably a little bit, a little bit cheaper to live there. And, um, and, and, and like you said, that's the cool thing about it, right? There's plenty of fishing. It's a little different than, you know, you're not fishing the, the high mountain streams, you know, right. for, for dry flies, but you've got all sorts of other saltwater yeah. stuff. And yeah. And on the other end of it, um, I have a, a neighbor that's moving up to, uh, in the Carolinas and almost close to uh, Tennessee and they have some phenomenal trout fishing and it's only, uh, you know, uh, eight, eight to 10 hours away. So I can still do my trout fishing if I need it. You can get there. Yeah, that's right. Good. Well, I'm looking at a page here, which has just some other hooks. I just want to see run by some of these, um, and see if we covered what we didn't cover. I'm looking at, I think we talked, so let me just throw some numbers out there and see if, if these ring about, did we, so the 2557, did we talk about that one today? 2557. It's like a little, um, it basically looks like a, no, I don't think we did. The 2557 is kind of like a little octopus hook, kind of, you know what I mean? It looks like it would be, um, you would use it as a trailer or something like that, or a little, um, you know, like a bait type hook. So you got that. But I do see the 2720, which you mentioned, right? Which was, that was the long, that was the stinger. That's a stinger hook, yeah. It's, uh, I got a box right here. It's. Matter of fact, these are five aughts, and uh, they're like they're a thinner hook, a thinner wire hook, but they they have a hook. The point it's not rounded; it's pinched up a little bit, and it's uh, it's more of a good grab for a, a bass bite. Oh right, yeah, that's what it is. It's made for. Is it made for? Do you think that hook is made for bass and a few certain species, or does it kind of overlap? over a number of different species. Yeah, I, I'm thinking it's a, a dynamite bass hook, and that's what it was probably designed for. I enjoy using it. It's a it's a good sticker, you know. I wouldn't use it for saltwater fish just because it's not stainless. But um, 
it's a, it's a, it's a great hook for uh, your freshwater large species like pike and uh, bass and you know all your your different types of bass. Yeah, perfect. And I'm looking now at kind of just more general categories. You've got kind of curved hooks, dry fly hooks, salmon hooks, saltwater bass, specialty hooks, streamer hooks, and wet fly, right? So I think we've covered a little bit of everything. I guess the curved hooks, maybe that's getting into more of some of those other patterns. Maybe we didn't dig into um, like, well, you know, some of the trout stuff, right? Basically, those curve hooks, you've heard of the, like clink, Clinkheimer. Yeah, specials. Clinkheimer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, any of your, the harrops flies, the uh, emergers, any of the emerging flies where you'd have, where they're breaking the surface and you'd have uh, like a shuck in the bottom and then you'd have some CDC or you'd have some deer hair on the top holding it up. That's where I'd use my curved hooks mostly. The curved hooks. Yeah. And what would be, there's a bunch of different types. Is there one you would recommend for tying one of those clean camera style? Well, they actually have a, uh, and I don't, I don't remember the number on it. Yeah. There's actually a clink hammer hook. Oh, there is. Okay. Yeah. And uh, I'd have to look that up. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. We'll put a, we'll find a link to that, the clink hammer hook. So that's. But uh, like for your um, zebra midges and your uh, bead head uh, pheasant tails, that curved hook works great. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that'll work great. Yeah. And I, I'm just looking at them. I mean, there's a bunch of these would, yeah, work great. They, they have a bunch of different styles, but I could use probably a number of these for the clean camera um, or that style. Okay. Yeah. At the, at the Atlanta show that I went to, I, I gave away all my, uh, my hook, my hook charts. And uh, I should have got a couple from Caleb, but. Oh, the hook charts. They actually have like a hook, uh, like all the hooks on a, right. on a sheet or something like that. Right. They have one, it's a hook comparison chart. And that's good too, because if you want to, you have a different brand and you can't get that brand, you can look at the Daiichi to f find out what they have that's comparable to it. Oh, I love that. Right. So that's it. So basically, if you have a hook, you don't know what it is, you can find out which Daiichi hook you would need to get sort of thing. There you go. Oh, wow. Okay. And I actually think I see that out here. Yeah. We'll put a link. There definitely is. I see it now. We'll put a link in the show notes to that. There it is, the hook comparison chart, which has uh, everything good. Okay. Well, that's a nice little resource we'll throw in here. Well, what else do you, uh, you know, anything else we're missing here? As, as far as, let's just think somebody's here thinking they're trying to, they're, you know, getting into fly tying. They're, they want to get their hooks, you know, to get started. I think we've given them a good selection. What are your thoughts? Right. Um, you know, basically... The nymph hooks and the dry fly hooks are something to start with, you know, for the basics, you know, and uh, and a small uh, streamer hook for like woolly boogers or uh, that type, and uh, and go from there. Uh, if if you're primarily a warm warm water fisherman and want to stay in that area of fly tying. Then I, then I would go in the specialty hooks and uh, I would try to get your feel for what species more, you know, like uh, I fished Lake Champlain with my uh, brother-in-law and they had enormous amount of fish in there, you know, pike, you know, big uh, lake trout, small mouths that were like six, eight pounds. <laughs> You know, wow. and it, you you can play around to see the size of hooks you need. And then it, if you want to go in deer hair, you can do that. Or if you want to carve and put balsa wood on them, you know, it's all relative to what you want. Right. What was that? What was that? Um, the show you, up in Atlanta, the show you went to, what do you do at the shows? Are you like presenting or what are you doing there? Oh, it's the fly fishing show. And they have them in a lot of different uh cities i used to go to the one in pleasanton california all the time well when i moved out here the closest one is atlanta georgia so i went to that show and they just give me a booth and i tie flies there oh right they just give you a booth and you're tying fly and what do you tie in there usually or what'd you tie this year usually i tie bass bugs because they want to see my uh 
they call it artwork. I do uh, Dahlberg divers, mouses, and the one that a lot of people like is I do a hummingbird, and uh, that's a little story in itself. What, what's that story? <laughs> what, what's the hummingbird? Let's hear the because well, the hummingbird. It's interesting because we did have the guest I mentioned, Joe Jackson. He actually ties some of those kind of crazy flies as well. Yeah, he's phenomenal. I saw him at uh, the last Pleasanton show I went to, mm. I think. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, he's really, he's a uh, high caliber guy, I tell you. But um, fishing the Delta, we'll get back to that. I was out and I saw a black bass jump out of the water and grab a red wing blackbird. Oh, wow, was, that's sweet. You know, and I says, Oh, Jeez. man, you know, you don't get to see that stuff. Well, I tied on a long streamer hook. I tied the body and the tail, and I had two small eyes sticking out of the sides of the body that I tied in with uh, those game changer links. And I put wings on them, and I put uh, black hen feathers, and then I put some red hen feathers halfway down on each side and then i tied on the end i tied a a black deer hair head and i left a little bit of the hook shank for the bill and i used that and i caught a black bass with that hook and that fly and it was amazed you know so i'm at the pleasanton show and uh one of my friends jeff courier sure you've heard of him he's pretty oh yeah yeah we've had him on a couple times yeah he said hey steve you know he heard me talking and you know we've been fishing a couple of times he goes could you tie a kingfisher and he he showed me a picture of one well i looked at it and it it looked like a bird that was made out of guinea hen feathers <laughs> you know it was black and white spotted so i tied one with uh deer hair and guinea hen feathers and i gave it to him he goes i want to give this to i can't remember the guy's name he's a photographer for yellow dog oh right brian i want to say yeah brian uh, i know you're talking about yep okay well he took he took that fly and that was it. You know, I didn't, Jeff gave it to him and that, that was fine with it. You know, I used to tie right in front of the yellow dog booth. <laughs> so it was kind of neat. So about oh, six months later, I get this thing in, in Facebook with Brian having a big uh, Kamchaka steelhead. And he's got that, that uh, fly that I tied the uh, Kingfisher in his mouth oh wow that's cool <laughs> so i got that's how i Amazing. started in my uh bird flies oh that's how it started right so they work oh, not only yeah, do they yeah. look cool but they work how do you fish the bird fly <laughs> yeah that's that's a bad thing because of the wings you need to put a swivel about 18 inches away from the uh, bird because it'll it'll tangle up your line real bad yeah God. And so you're fishing that just like you would, like, how would you fish that if you're on the water fishing for, you know, well, I guess you mentioned two species, but what would that look like? Oh, I would, I would just put it pretty close to, to any kind of overhanging bush. And I would just throw it over, if there was a, a, a stream, I would put it right on the edge of the stream so it would carry out a little bit. Oh, right. Carry out. Yeah. yeah. So it's like going away. Yeah. It's moving away. And then... I had a guy come up to me and he, he says, Hey, Steve, I seen your bird flies, but I want to give my, uh, it was either his grandfather or his father. I want to give him uh, a gift. And he smokes cigars all the time. Could you tie him a cigar fly? So I've been doing that. That's, that's, that's kind of a joke. Oh, wow. Cigar <laughs> fly. What do you, what, what's that tied out? Deer hair? Yeah. It's all deer hair and it's a, a large streamer hook. Right, the uh, not the big wide gap one, but just your typical streamer hook. Right. 
What would be? Let's leave. Let's leave it on that. Let's do a cigar. What would be the hook if somebody's going to tie the cigar fly with a Daiichi? What would what would be the number? Uh, twenty four sixty one, I believe. All right, perfect. Yeah, we'll leave we'll leave it that. That's good. That's the perfect summary to <laughs> the uh, the hook selection. Um, but let's let's do our. Um, we've got a quick little rapid fire round. Um, a few little questions. I, I've been. I, I was trying to call this a two minute drill, but it seems like it's taken ten minutes. So we'll try to see if we can keep it shorter today. Um, but yeah, let's just jump in these. These will be easy, quick ones uh, to take us out of here, if that sounds good. So what is your, you know, if you think about, you've mentioned, you know, in Florida now with all these species, just looking at Florida, what would be the one species down there you haven't chased yet or caught that you'd like to catch? Well, you know, as much as I've fished for bonefish, I've caught some big bonefish in Hawaii and in uh, the Keys, and it, but they have a couple of bonefish that come up up in here that I've heard of catching. But uh, I'd like to go down to the Keys and catch uh, a slam, you know. I've caught all the fish, but I've never got a slam. The slam, which is all three in one day, right? Right. Bonefish tarpon permit. Right. And this area that I live in, uh, central, well, it'd be uh, eastern central Florida, we have tarpon. And we have quite a bit of tarpon, and I've caught a lot of the tarpon. And um, there's a permit that you can catch every once in a while, but this ha- hasn't happened here. But down the, in the uh, in the Keys, in the Keys, it doesn't happen all the time, but it it can happen. <laughs> yeah, we talked. Uh, Bruce Chart is kind of our guy down there. We're we're planning a trip to head down his way, and we talked about that on an episode. How you know that's yeah that that's what you know giant tarpon right that's one thing would be amazing but yeah. getting all three in a day would be pretty cool so all right so we got that what would be you know just thinking of um you know again on hooks we've been talking about hooks but if you had to pick one hook you could tie with and that's it for the rest of your days what what would be the hook number well especially for this area it would be that uh 2546 yeah 2546 okay it's a saltwater hook that you could use in in freshwater you know, in the smaller size. Could you use that for a? Could you use that for a giant tarpon? Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. There you go. Definitely. There you go. The giant tarpon. Yeah. Awesome. And uh, yeah. What's your? Um, I always love to hear this one, so we can get some uh, some music in the in the show notes. Do you have uh, like thinking back over your life? Do you have any, you know, types of music or um, you know groups or folks that you you listen to or you have listened to? I kind of like reggae. Oh, nice. You know, and uh, perfect. Me too. I'm, you know, uh, I like the islands music, and uh, it's a lot of fun to be on a boat. There was this guy, uh, one of my Derek Russ, he's a guide in uh, marathon. He liked to put uh, uh, reggae music on it when we were fishing down there, and it, it, it was really good. So you were listening to music, reggae music on, like out in a boat with the speaker sort of thing on the water. Exactly. <laughs> and what kind of, do you, you probably don't remember what kind of speaker it was, but this is interesting because I, I saw this story out there and it was this person. Um, it was actually interesting because it was a guest we had on, on the, on the podcast, but he was really um, railing on the fact that somebody was listening to music on his local river or it was, I think it might've been a lake <laughs> yeah. and he actually even called, he even called us out because we had a, you know, a sponsor in the past who was turtle box, who I think are actually yeah. a great company, a great group of guys. But it was interesting because he was kind of calling us out because we had supported this company. And the way I thought about it was, Hey, you know what I mean? Like, I don't necessarily do that all the time, but right. it's not like, you know what I mean? Like everybody's respectful, but what does that look like? Do you find that, 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 you know, is kind of a okay thing to do in some areas? Yeah. Well, you know, um, if you're out in the ocean, you know, and there's no boats around, that's that's one thing. But if you're fishing the mangroves close to town and there's quite a few boats around, uh, I wouldn't put Snoop Dogg on, you know, uh, at 80 decibels, you know. <laughs> yeah. They might shoot you. <laughs> And that's where the the respect, like just your normal fly angler, probably isn't going to do that, right? Right. 
so good. Okay, great. And uh, so give us one last story here. So uh, we've been talking about Daiichi today. Do you have a like any sort of a Daiichi story or a connection to any, anything you want to give a shout out here? I was going to ask you either like a, a story about your days in the, the service, but I figured Daiichi might be an easier, shorter one to do. Well, there was one story that I really, I mean, it was kind of bragging on me, but Bill Chase used to be the Daiichi guy at Sports Angler Group. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And um, he was my man that I checked, you know, hey, Bill, I need some hooks. Hey, I need, uh, what shows are you going to be at or whatever, you know? Well, me and my friend, uh, Chuck, we entered a bass and fly tournament in, uh, in the Bay Area in the California Delta. And uh, we went through and he, he gave us hats and he gave us uh, some tags to wear on our shirts. And it, which I thought it was pretty neat, you know, but we won that the first bass and fly tournament. Oh, wow. And Chuck, and it was amazing. Well, he found out about it and he posted it on his website. <laughs> nice. Wow. You won the tournament. What was this type of tournament? This was a, like you're out there just catch as many fish as possible. It was uh no, it was uh for black bass in a certain area. And it was uh the first one was only a one day event. Now there are two days events. And it was Chuck and myself on my boat and we were uh fishing for uh black bass only. And we had a weigh in and we won the weigh in. And it's a matter of fact, they have a two day tournaments now and we still own the one day uh poundage it was uh 18 pounds over 18 pounds oh wow god so that's gigantic there you go perfect so that is a good that is a good fish story yeah <laughs> a true one a true one right yeah and you know it, it, and when he put it in uh on his website that made it all the more sweeter, you know? <laughs> That's it. Perfect. Good deal. Well, we'll try to look up some more information there on that event if we can and throw it in the show notes. Maybe we'll get some pictures from you. Um, nice. Well, I think that's good, Steve. I think we've covered it pretty well. We'll send everybody out actually at uh, wetflyswing.com slash Daiichi. People can check out uh, and connect with you there. They've got a list of um, some of their pro staff and folks like that. So we'll We'll keep you there. And uh, yeah, until we uh, talk again, Steve, thanks for all your time today and appreciate you for uh, stopping in. Hey, well, thank you. I appreciated the time. There it is. Steve Potter, wetflyswing.com slash 443. Wetflyswing.com slash 443. You can check it out. Check out that, uh, I'm hoping that Red Wing Blackbird uh, is there. Hopefully there's something. And, uh, and I know we've had some episodes where we've definitely covered some of these crazy patterns. So we'll see what we can put there in the show notes. A uh, quick shout out before we get out of here, the schooloffishing.co, schooloffishing.co is where you can find out our next trip, what we have coming. And if you're interested, we actually have an ambassadors program that we have going there. So if you want to find out how you can get involved in some of these trips and help uh, coordinate this and get on the water and connect with some of these amazing anglers, amazing gurus, everybody that we have going from the podcast, check it out right now. Quick listener shout out before we get out of here. Phil Thomas. Quick one from Phil Thomas. Phil, short and sweet here. Phil says he reached out by email and said, I live in Wales and my favorite fish to fish for is grayling. Nice, Phil. Thanks for checking in. I appreciate you for uh, saying hi and, uh, and love what you have going. I love that you are on the other side of the pond and you're checking out some of these episodes. Grayling is one that... Uh, that we love, and and I hope to put together another episode soon on grayling. We've had a few. We've had some Alaska. We've had some. Uh, we've had some across the pond in your neck of the woods. But we're going to keep digging into that. If you want to get a shout out on this podcast and have us put together an episode for you, reach out to me anytime, Dave at Wetfly Swing. And if you haven't connected with me in a long time, or if you're new to the show and I haven't heard from you, send me an email. That's the best way I know that there's people listening. And you're enjoying what we're putting together. And I'll keep on keeping on and keep this thing rolling. All right. Let's take a look. See where we are heading next. Tomorrow, we've got an amazing episode. Jeff Liskey. This is the Great Lakes Dude podcast number two. Jeff's coming back on this one to dig into Steelhead. 
he had an intro episode in episode number one. If you haven't seen that, you can check that out. And episode number two is going to be all Steelhead. He's also our Steelhead guide up on the Great Lakes and our Steelhead School East. Uh, that's Jeff Liske. So we had this epic trip last year. We're going to be doing that again this year. And actually, that's not too far off when we're going to be launching that event, um, which always kicks off with a big giveaway. We're going to be doing that again this year. And, uh, and we're just going to be putting together another amazing trip. And I'm excited to get down there. The thing I remember most about that trip is, well, I remember a lot. But one thing that always comes to my, net, my mind is the uh, fireside chat. It was the, uh, I think, the first official fireside chat. And we passed around the mic. So I ho- I'm hoping that we're going to do that again. And I'm excited. If you don't know Jeff, you got to check in with him. If you're in that area, he, he's kind of covering uh, that part of Lake Erie, the south shore of Lake Erie. And they get a bunch of steelhead, like 1.5 million steelhead out there. All right, that's what I got. That's what I got for you today. I hope you enjoy that episode uh, with with Steve. Uh, that was a fun one. And another shout out to Daiichi. They've got a killer product, and I'm excited to have them on this year. And I'm excited to be digging in more. We're going to have some more podcast episodes similar to this. All right. I hope you're having a good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, wherever in the world you are. And I appreciate you for stopping in today and checking out the show. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com.